So yeah, let's do this. Uh, about a week ago, maybe a little bit more, I was at the Monte Carlo Casino, okay? Like the original Monte Carlo Casino. Went in, I'm gonna bet, I'm gonna win some money. I'm like, I'm gonna win this, I got this. So I don't know about you guys, but like the Monte Carlo method is a thing, right? Monte Carlo simulations are a thing. I don't think anyone does them. If you do them, that's great. I think we just do them to pass certs, but they're a thing. And, and what do we do in cybersecurity? We do risk assessment. I bet you I could watch those dice roll and go, my risk is this. I was ready, walked in with confidence, and my suit got my drink. At the end of the night, I was broke. Went perfect. It's one of those nights where like, I wish someone had done a pre-mortem on that, like pull me aside and go, Wolf, well, really, you know, hackers can't gamble. <laughs> this is a bad idea. I'm still convinced, I'm still convinced that the answer to cybersecurity will not be found within cybersecurity. It might not be found in a casino, <laughs> but they'll be found in other domains, other disciplines. I think they're there to be found in cybersecurity we would have found them already in the past couple of decades. But today I'm talking about postmortems. Now, if at this point in time you're thinking, what is a pre-mortem? Good news, good news, I will be talking about that. If at this point in time you're thinking, what is the Monte Carlo method? More good news. I will not be talking about that. <laughs> Don't do that, it's too much math. My name's Wolfgang Gorlick, and I'm gonna be discussing zero trust, this future of zero trust, right? So first off, everyone has a definition, and this is mine. There's a million different ways to think about zero trust. This is a set of principles. It's a set of strategies to satisfy a use case. It's an architecture, I love all those. This is my approach, this is the one I'm gonna be using. I say this not because it's right, it's probably not. I say this so you know where I'm coming from. It's a trust boundary, right? I'm gonna extend trust. It's a short live trust boundary. Why do we trust things forever? I don't know, right? It's not gonna be years, it's gonna be per session, per connection, short live. Tightly scoped between me and my device and the application I'm connecting to. Informed by policy, and then that policy, of course, is fed by trust signals and trust inferences. That's gonna be my, my uh, idea for zero trust. I'm standing by that. A pre-mortem comes from medical first, obviously, but then the project management world. The project management world has been doing pre-mortems for a couple decades now. The idea is very simple. If you've ever done a tabletop in your existing environment, think about that, but think about in the future. It's the future. We're gonna do a hypothetical scenario. We're gonna talk through some things, see what works, see what doesn't. And why do we do that? We do that because if we assume we're gonna fail, we can come up with some good scenarios, some good strategies. If someone was just to go, Wolf, you're going to the casino, really? How much money you're bringing? That would be a really good pre-mortem, right? Those types of things is what we wanna do. So I would invite you over the course of the next hour together to grab your very favorite time machine, maybe one of these three, maybe one that's not on, we're gonna assume it is 2028. We're gonna assume that people have embraced zero trust. We're gonna assume that nowhere on the vendor floor is zero trust mentioned at RSA. It's 2028. It's probably all chat GPT. But, and then we're gonna assume that a breach has occurred. Now, why did that breach occur? That's what I wanna know. That's what I wanna figure out. Those are the questions I wanna answer. I'm gonna to talk to the top of the hour, by the way. I will answer questions afterwards. I'm sorry, I got a lot of content. Not enough uh, time, nearly enough time. Broadly, I'm gonna break down three main areas that I think the Zero Trust went awry that led to the breach. So people problem, surprisingly enough. Uh, it was a mistake in how we configured it or how we managed identities. And finally, it was policy enforcement. That is where we're going. Now, I'm gonna ask something of you guys. This is very important. Every single time we have a security control, uh, there seems to be this, this uh, almost knee-jerk reaction. Oh, it doesn't do everything, and I don't wanna do it, right? You guys, you guys sense that? Do you guys feel that sometimes? I was looking at LinkedIn, and my wife, my wife who's not a technologist, emailed me this morning and said, can you look at this and tell me your opinion? Because this doesn't seem right. I pulled it up and this is CISO who's like, oh, by the way, encryption is, uh, isn't needed because people can work around it. What? <laughs> what? So I would invite you and I would ask of you that if you are 
this talk and you come away with the idea that zero trust isn't worth it, <laughs> get out. If you're like, wait a minute, MFA is a waste of time because people will, yes, I know the workaround, it's still worth it. Why are we managing our devices? Please people, manage your devices, segment your traffic. We can do this together. Also, if you're listening to this talk and going, yeah, some guy from Cisco said there's a breach and talked about it, also please get out. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. It's a hypothetical in the future. Cool, are we good with that? All right, so 2028. We read the news. It's a large company. We know the company well. I'm not going to name the name. Uh, I think I saw a case study on one of the vendors' websites about how they did zero trust. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, and then the news hits. They've been breached. And we all pile on in social media and we blame this and we blame that. We don't really know what happened. Start hearing things from the back channel. I think it was this, I think it was that. We're at RSA over drinks. We run on one of the guys and I'm like, yeah, let me tell you a story. And we buy him a few drinks and he tells us the story. And this is what we learn. It was a people problem. Starting with this, the greatest or worst trick consultants ever pulled was to convince the world that zero trust was a journey. I'll tell you why. Back to 2022 for just a minute, we'll leave 2028 in the future for just a minute. The word of the year, goblin mode. Did you guys hear about this? Fantastic. Why am I doing dishes? I can DoorDash stuff. Why am I showering or shaving? Zoom makes me look so handsome. I'm telling you, all my profile photos going through Zoom from now on. Uh, why, why am I doing so many things? I can just go into goblin mode and hobble, right? Which is weird because if you remember 2020, if you're at RSA after 2020, about a month after that, we all were in cottage core mode. This was something new. This was something different. No one liked it. We we're going to make the best out of it. People were baking bread. My wife was making blankets. People were singing sea shanties. Please bring back the sea shanties, by the way. I love those. Um, and the bread and the blankets, but mostly the sea shanties. This was, a, this was a time where we were all committed, right? In two years, we went from cottage court to goblin. This is what I call the cottage to goblin cycle. <laughs> and it's not just the pandemic. You guys ever walk into a sock and go, why do you have four sims? I had a, a lead uh, sim architect who called this the sim graveyard. You buy one, you love it, it's great, everyone's excited, we bake bread, maybe not bread, we roll out the sim, and then three months later, four months later, we forget about it. Two years later, we're like, why are we running that vendor? It's clearly that vendor's problem, we'll buy a new product. Rinse and repeat over a few years. I did uh, IAM consulting, one of four practices I ran before my current role at Cisco. And uh, IGA tools were the worst. We spent millions on this IGA tool. It is the best thing ever. Everyone's excited. We had a racy. We got together. We made, I'm still on the blankets and quilts, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, we were excited about this. And we wired it up to our HR system and Active Directory. And three years later, we're wondering why we're paying millions for this. Why did Zero Trust fail and that breach occur? Because the people stopped being excited about it, because they stopped holding each other accountable, because they stopped making progress, because someone told us it was a journey, and we forgot to remember that we need to tell people where we're going and why, and show continuous progress. Now, next thing, who are those people? Boy, RSA over drinks, it gives you a look, and you're like, oh my God, really? It's like, you wouldn't believe, I didn't get the buy-in, I didn't get the support, when we looked at this, we being Cisco, we do a security outcomes report, annual report, 5,000 people, 25 to 30 countries, annual report. There's a version of this that's available that is the uh, Zero Trust Guide to, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, Zero Trust uh, Maturity Guide. And what we found was, I found this very fascinating. What we found was people who said they were mature at Zero Trust had some things in common. They were twice as likely to say the executives liked them. They are twice as likely to say their peers supported them. They're twice as likely to say their people stayed around, staff retention. They're twice as likely to say their organization supported them through security culture. Is the bumper sticker like zero trust saves lives? Kumbaya, you know? No, no it's not. What it is is, if you can do those, if you can maintain those relationships, the networking team can do the segmentation, the identity team can do multi-factor, right? The help desk can handle the help desk work. Yet oftentimes the cottage core 
and goblin mode, right? The catch the goblin cycle sucks in and we lose track of all those things. So do we have good relationships? And then, oh boy, let me tell you, 2028. We thought we were good because we protected our crown jewels. How many applications do you guys have? Do you anyone look at that recently? 10, 50, 100, 5,000, 10,000? We used to roll CASBs, and I always loved it because I'd ask the CISO, I said, hey, how many apps do you have? And they go, we have 100. <laughs> Great. Knowing full well by the end of the project, I'd be like, here's the 1,500 apps you have. You should probably look at those. So oftentimes, in scope is our top 100 apps. Great. Maybe we have 250 in SSO. Great. That makes sense. SSO is becoming a real big part of Zero Trust. Um, but we have like thousands. But why aren't they all in SSO? Well, because maybe they don't support it. Maybe it doesn't support SAML or Auth IDC. Uh, maybe it's too much work. Maybe it's shadow IT. Maybe, 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 maybe. OK, but why about this 250 aren't all those protected by Zero Trust? Well, it's too much work. The app owners are busy. Maybe, 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 maybe. In scope for projects, right? If we think about that um, Cottage the Goblin cycle, create a project, win. Three to six months, people are excited, they're engaged. Win, awesome for that scope. But what we long learned with any sort of uh, adversary emulation is whatever's in scope with us is not in scope for the adversary. It's almost the exact opposite, right? I have a real strong wall. I got a great door. It is barricaded. There is someone on the other side of the door making sure. Are the adversaries going in there or are they going in that other door, right? They're not going in where the security is. They're going in where we're not. Same exact thing is happening on the people side. When you look at many of these projects, how well defined is your scope? It's all my employees, that's great. I was doing some consulting, I was helping a SaaS company, getting ready for Federan. I was like, awesome, tell me about your IM. They're like, we did this. I'm like, that's great, what about that? We got this, I'm like, that's awesome, how do you measure? KPI, I'm like, bang, man, you guys are awesome. So what about your contractors? They said, it's been really nice talking to you. That's not a good sign. And by the way, a quarter of their workforce was contractors. That was out of scope. So this is what's going to get us. If not this, another thing. Again, this is from the um, Zero Trust Maturity Guide. Where are people running their technology if they're mature? This is what we asked. This is what we found. Mature folks, not surprisingly, twice as likely to be in the cloud. Awesome. We're securing SaaS apps. We can do that. We're good at that. Awesome. What struck me about this data is even mature orgs, look at all that on-prem stuff. It's a lot of on-prem stuff. I think one of the things we forget is that the modern enterprise is 10 to 20 years of technical debt pulled forward by the latest cloud, blockchain, AI, ML thingy. But that AI, ML thingy is what we're scared about, right? It's what we build products about. It's what we give conferences about. It's what we do roundtables about. It's what we write white papers about. I did a video about the AI, ML thingy, and now I've got 10,000 views. Awesome, great. What about the rest? Well, well, we'll worry about that when the legacy technology rolls off. So I think one of the other concerns from a people process and scope perspective is making sure that we haven't over-rotated and ignored the existing, oftentimes much larger tech base. That on-prem, the OT, the mainframe, those sort of things. All right, so what do we learn? What mistakes do we make? With zero trust, one of the things I wanted to ask, by the way, with the field guide, and I, I didn't get to ask about it, was like, who should own it? Who should run it? Is it a COE? Is it a PMO? Is it your architecture team? Um, and the more I started looking at the data and the more I've had conversations, it's really been fascinating. None of that matters. <laughs> it can succeed in any one of those domains. What matters is what team has the process for managing that cottage to goblin cycle, right? What team knows how to keep people engaged and excited? What team has the relationships? What team is able to execute, that is the team that's going to be successful when we look at zero trust. Uh, if you go, hey, I heard recently that we should have it by our PML, or wouldn't it be great to have a COE? And you stand up a COE, and they don't know anybody, and they haven't had successes, and they don't have the relationships, it's not going to work. It's very intriguing to watch the relationship of those things. And then, of course, that scope side, which will definitely get us. That's the people. It's always the people problem.
But people's all we have around here. All right, 2028, 2028 again. We're at a round table. Birds of a feather session, maybe? Maybe an Avanta round table? We're hanging out. We got this person that we really trust. We've watched their program, we've listened to them. How'd you do that? They always seem to be a little bit ahead of us. And we're talking about zero trust and we're talking about our programs and everything. And, uh, and they lean back and they keep this deep, shuddering breath. You know the breath, you've seen the breath. I'm sure you've seen the breath. They go, <sighs> and they verify there's no sales guys in the room. And they say, let me tell you what happened <laughs> to us recently. I'd love to tell you guys, but Chatham House rules is still a thing in 2028, so believe me, it's bad. Let's talk about zero trust being a strongly authenticated user on a strongly authenticated device, right? This is the NIST architecture. Zero trust, principles, strategy, architecture. You may be looking at this going, Wolf, that's not at all what our zero trust architecture looks like. That's cool, that's fine. This is a scenario, this is the example. Do this in your own environment. If you follow the NIST guidance, maybe you have something like this. And you've got this person on their device over there connecting up through this trust boundary, this tightly defined short live trust boundary, right, to the resource. Let's look at that authorized subject and authorized system. First off, multi-factor. I like multi-factor. <laughs> it's, it's a good thing. I like passwordless. It's a good thing. I think we've all learned that not all multi-factor is created equally. We've all learned that some factors are stronger than others. Um, passwordless has made a tremendous amount of strides in terms of being fish resistant and uh, having some great security properties where you know, it's domain bound and everything else. Um, but passwordless is gonna be bypassed, right? There's already people 3D printing fingerprints. There's already been facial recognition attacks. Um, please, again, don't take that as saying, well, I heard Wolf on stage and we're not doing passwordless. No, please, love passwordless, great feature as a user benefit in a, a zero trust business case. Point is, these things always get attacked. Even if we've got good factors available to us, are they available to every worker? There is certainly a degree of haves and have nots in our world, right? Uh, across businesses, within businesses. Let me give you an example. You are now the CISO, congratulations, of a, um, restaurant system. Restaurant system employs around 60,000 people, and this restaurant system has around 1,000 uh, back office folks, and of those 1,000 back office folks, around 100 of them are IT folks. What factors are you buying for these folks? Are we giving them all security keys? Are we managing that life, right? We should, I would love to do it, but are we talking about a college kid who's gonna work for a couple months and then leave? How do I get the key back? How do I manage that, right? Or, as you're thinking about that, and if you've got a good solution, follow me, because CISOs jump job to job, you're about to get a promotion. Uh, if you haven't got a solution for that, stay with them, figure it out, and tell me after this. Uh, now, you went, you know what? <laughs> I'm done with the restaurant industry. I'm gonna join the factory. I'm gonna join manufacturing. And I'll say, thank you, coming from Detroit. I love that. All the rest of you are like, what I, why would we do that? But Detroit needs you, come, come with us. It's great, good restaurants, low cost of living. Uh, what about factory workers? How are they authenticating? We're gonna let them have their phone at the, at the machines? Is that okay if they're like running a machine plus like maybe browsing Reddit or clicking approve? I don't know, probably not. So we already are gonna have gaps and haves and have nots around who has factors. Even for the best factors, right? You've heard both of those scenarios, you're like, no problem, I know how to talk to the board. Boom, everyone in manufacturing gets passwordless. Thank you, I love you guys. What'd you do in healthcare? You're gonna tell me later, right? And then the restaurant system, I'm sure you guys have that solved, fill me in. But you solved that, awesome. Now, the other thing that we're starting to see as more people are on multi-factor is the attack loose to the life cycle, the life cycle of that authentication device. How do I enroll it? How do I replace it? What happens if it gets lost? What happens if hypothetically your name is Wolfgang and you decide, hey, wouldn't it be great to get a new phone before traveling? And oh, by the way, I don't want to port everything because a fresh start is good. Completely hypothetically, my poor help desk. I'm like, how do I move stuff? They're like, you did what? You can't. 
I'm like, but I want to. They're like, you can't. <laughs> it was a lot of work. But how do they even know it's me? Now, thankfully, our help desk is pretty good at that. But as we all know, these are the types of attacks that will occur against life cycles. That's on the user side. A lot of that I'm sure you guys already know. Let's talk about the device side. The device side is even more exciting. Of course, we saw the same full life cycle problem that we had for or authentication devices that we'll have for access devices. Someone's got a new laptop. We gotta send out a laptop for someone who's just hired. People are working remote. How do we get them the password? All those same problems still occur. How does Zero Trust authenticate a device. How do we do that? We know that's part of the principles. How do we do that? Maybe we say it's domain joined. We don't have to worry about Macs. <laughs> or, or Macs are not in scope. That's my other favorite. Macs are not in scope. Cool. Domain joined. It wasn't that long ago where adversaries were uh, using or manipulating Kerberos to take over domain join machines and take over their creds. I'm sure most of you guys know that when the domain join, what it means is you've got a computer account with a lovely dollar sign, you've got a computer password, you can take that over. There are similar tactics, although not in well use, thank goodness, for Azure AD. So we know that it's possible if we can get the machine to extract those creds and reproduce that. So you might say, that's no problem, Wolf. Um, why would you do domain join anyways? You've got Max. Do cert based auth. And I'll say, thank you. Love that. Because it's hard. It's hard for an adversary to steal a certificate. But you know what's not hard for an adversary to do? Send a request from their machine to a CA and say, hi, I'm new. Will you send me a authorized cert? And now, when I go to log in, of course I'm a managed device. I have the cert. Spectre Ops did a paper on this about a year, maybe two years ago. If you guys want to read about it. So you're like, okay, well, that's clearly bad. <laughs> Maybe we'll use agents. All right, let's talk about agents and making API calls. I'll get back to that. Or um, let's also think about how those API calls and the very checks are performed can be manipulated, can be misconfigured. I'm also gonna get back to that when I get to the policies section. The point is, from a pre-mortem perspective, there's three things you need to think about when you think about device identity. Adversaries can either uh, steal and impersonate an existing device identity. I don't want a managed device, I want Wolf's managed device. Uh, adversaries can promote their machine to be a managed device, an authorized device. I don't care if it's Wolf's device, I just want a Cisco device. Or adversaries can spoof and fake the policy side. Right? Fun stuff. Now, in back in our time machines, it's 2028, come back just a little bit, come back just a little bit. 2008, people were already bypassing multi-factor. Google goes and does Beyond Corp, what is that, 2012, I think, right? Google does Beyond Corp, and what do they say? We've rolled out multi-factor and all attacks stopped. That is cool, that is awesome. 2023, everyone else is doing multi-factor, <laughs> suddenly people are bypassing it. Why do I say this? Because if you have the opportunity right now, it is, it is 2008 and 2012 time, if you have the opportunity right now to say, you know what, I wanna do device identity and prevent everyone else from logging in, do it, tremendous stopping power. By 2028, have a mitigating control. And why don't we do that anyways? Have you guys ever thought about how ridiculous this is? There is 16 billion devices on the planet. That is a big attack surface. How come they can all log in as me? Or you? Right? I don't know the size of your company or your company. Let's say you're mid size. Your guys probably have what? 20,000 devices? 16 billion to 20,000 is pretty damn good <laughs> in terms of attack reduction. What's better is what if it's just your two devices, your two devices, you can log in? Huge stopping power. Huge, huge, huge. Now, will our series work around it? Yes. Are they now? Nope. Which gets to actually the reason why I started this talk. I was so infuriated about MFA fatigue attacks. 28,000 hits about people going, oh man, throw away MFA, throw away MFA. I'm like, that, that, oh. if anyone was at, uh, at RSA over the past few years or any conference, they, we knew when enough people did this that it will be compromised. Just like phishing. I love, I love, 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 love watching phishing attacks, right? How do you stop phishing? Will you prevent an executable? That worked. 
until 20% of people are doing it. Then they started sending ISOs. We're going to block ISOs. It's awesome. Image files. <laughs> Got us a couple more months, right? Now it's, we're going to read those emails. And every email is going to signature and we're going to block that. Awesome. What happens when ChatGPT is spinning up emails individually for all of us? Yeah, that goes out the window. We see this again and again. We know this is how it works. But yet somehow, we sometimes forget that when the actual breaches start occurring. And I'm shocked. I'm shocked. So much so that is my shock face, in case you're curious. <laughs> uh, I look just like that. One of the things that I've, I've often said is whenever control reaches critical mass, the control will be bypassed. Another way to say that is all a better mousetrap does is breed better mice. That's why we need to do pre-mortems. All right, now, if we're doing authenticated users on authenticated devices through an encrypted connection, um, where do people go? Where do people go and attack you when you have end-to-end -end protection? You go to the ends. From an end-user perspective, from an endpoint perspective, that means a couple different things. Line weight malware is, is going to be on the increase. Uh, a few years ago, I was helping a CISO rebuild his program uh, after they got compromised, and it was so sad. They did everything right. They had a good set of folks, security conscientious, updated machines. They were logging in with a long password. They had multi-factor. They weren't clicking remember me. They were doing all the right things. Line weight malware was installed on their accounting devices. They waited until accountants logged in with that super long password, with that multi-factor, opened up the accounts. They took over the browser session, transferred money. Great controls. Please keep those controls. But those types of attacks are going to be in the increase. In addition, we're going to start seeing more attacks around the people side. You guys seen the XKCD comic? I'm sure you have, right? Speaking of encryption, uh, super encryption, we're stopped. Next panel is like, what happens in the real world? Hit him with a wrench, and he'll give us the stuff, right? That's what you need to think about. The bribery, the extortion, those sort of things are going to be on the rise. What that means is endpoint controls are more important. Insider threat is more important if you've got good zero trust. All right, so that's one example. What does that other say? <laughs> a strongly authenticated user on a strongly authenticated device through an encrypted connection, that's the front end of, of zero trust. Where are they going to hit? They're going to circumvent some of those, uh, those signals of trust, how we've authenticated both the user and the device. Or hit someone with a wrench. But that's kind of dark. Let's, <laughs> let's go on to the next one. All right. It is 2028. We've had a security breach. Now, please, if you guys go, Wolf said Cisco had a security breach in 2028 on social media, I'm going to be very angry at all you. No, we had a security breach, right? And the CIO and the CCO are shouting, we did zero trust. The consultants told us it was a journey. We've been on a journey. And the CISO's like, um, I don't want to go back to manufacturing or the restaurant industry. Let's get together, let's huddle figure out what happened. Here's what happened. It was the policy, right? Zero trust architecture, tight trust boundary, enforced by policy. Let's talk about that policy side of things. Because there's some fun stuff there. First off, I would argue, uh, and again, personal opinion, I would argue the difference between a security architecture and a zero trust security architecture is effectively that policy enforcement side. I've been plugging things in the networks forever. I've been running things on desktops forever. I'm sending emails forever. At least it feels that way. Uh, what changes is when I run that request through a policy engine to decide whether to extend trust or revoke trust. That's what I would argue is the defining characteristic of zero trust. So what could possibly go wrong? First off, a, a reminder that <laughs> modern orgs, 10 to 20 years of technical debt, right? pulled forward by the legacy, or by the latest tech stack. Uh, you might say, that's fine, we're fixing that right now. I've got really bad news uh, in this 2028 scenario. Whatever we built in 22 and 23, there's someone undoing it right now complaining about how we did it. That's now legacy. I was super excited to rip out, as a CISO in financial services, rip out mainframes 
and replace them with a modern web stack. Oh, it's shiny. We built it with DevOps. It was exciting. I talked at RSA stage about it. I was pumped. I felt good. Uh, I was telling that story to some college kids. And I was feeling real good about it. They're like, oh, that's cool. What, what would you use? I'm like, I think it was SQL 2012. And dang if one of those brats, I'm sorry if you're listening to this. <laughs> Don't mean to call you a brat. But one of those guys comes off and, uh, and they say, oh, did you know that went end of life last year? Don't tell me that. I was so excited. And I know, I know some poor person had to undo everything I did and was thinking, why would they make these choices? Those are terrible choices, right? Today's improvement, tomorrow's legacy. So all that's to say, every new flow can't use the strongest policy enforcement. We can't. We can't do that because we may be running things to a mainframe. If you're in a credit union and you're using Jack Henry, um, and this is based on a real example, we can do all the zero trust stuff we want. Oh, I'm checking the user, I'm checking the device, I'm encrypting the connection, I'm doing everything through a policy engine. To get them to a VDI where they're gonna log in on a flat network, which is fine, it's cool. But we got two architectures, right? And we know where the adversary is gonna hit, they're gonna hit where it's weaker. Compensating controls become incredibly important as the primary control gets stronger, as anyone who's ever done something like PCI knows. <sighs> but <coughs> let's imagine everything's fine. We've got a good policy, we've got a good engine, agent-based solution. What, uh, what could an adversary possibly do with that? Well, turns out that when you're on that agent, two things are happening. One, you're checking the device, LPC, and another thing is you're going to then send that response back over a REST API or to a graph API, cool, over a web thing. So, could an adversary send bad data to that agent? Yeah, yeah, we've seen people mess with responses from the file system, from the registry, uh, over uh, uh, you know, bash, over LPC call, sure, yeah. Maybe not likely, but it could happen. Um, what happens if the first request comes from the agent and says, don't trust Wolf's device, this is terrible, it's jailbroken and infected, and I'm sure he's trying to convince Duel to put Duel back on it. What happens if after that request, we send another that says, hey guys, everything's fine. How does the policy agent respond to that? They take the first one or the second one? Or, or, for those of you in, uh, in adversarial emulation land, what if we put a proxy in the local box, right? What if you're running burp suite, and if you're bored, try this, right? Run burp suite on your box, stop the request, modify it, and send it. <laughs> Does that get accepted or dropped? Depends on the product, it depends on the implementation. So yeah, adversaries may mess with that. Um, what else could we do? Well, you know, a lot of both of those scenarios I just walked you through were workforce scenarios, right? It's my employee, they're on my box, I've got some control over it. What about customer scenarios? Anyone doing zero trust with customers? Oh, come on guys, you gotta do zero trust with customers. It's fun, it's exciting. And, and the talk about we've done this before, the customer teams will love you because they'll be like, uh, don't you mean fraud? They're like, yes, but we're gonna call it zero trust and it's snazzy. Like, okay, we're on. I'm on to you, but we're on. How do, you, how do you do trust with that? You check where the user's from. You check the user's browser. You check what software's installed, right? You check cookies. You check all the signatures. Have you guys heard of the, the um, Genesis market? You guys, he's nodding, yeah. That's exciting, right? Recently shut down, and I'm sure it'll never come back. But here was the idea. You took a fingerprint of the customer's device, you gave it to them, and they spun up a virtual machine. Oh, Wolf's in Detroit? We'll route that through a VPN through Detroit. How's that for trust signals, right? Everything is now spoofable. Now, are adversaries doing that at large? No, because none of you raised your hand and are doing customer zero trust. You should do it. The first 10 of you who do it are gonna be amazing. The last 10 will probably be complaining that it, why do we do it anyways, it's getting breached. That's security for you, that's the game. Speaking of the game, another thing I, I find is exciting, and I used to do some talks on this, I had to give some workshops on this, so Mistaken Identities was the, the collection of this. And, and not to be overdramatic, but all the controls we do at the end of the day are resulting in security that's hanging by a string. What do I mean by that? I mean, if I've gone through all those controls that I mentioned, what do I get back? 
to my SSO portal before I launch an app. SAML assertion, JSON web token, a cookie, right? A nice set of string that we can exchange. Then we say, Wolf, there's security properties of all of those. I've read the OAuth OIDC RFCs and I've read the threat models. First of all, I don't believe that last part if anyone has, <laughs> but right, those things exist. Uh, I was watching Mastodon yesterday and uh, Bill Semp, love Bill Semp, AppSec guy through and through, was doing an audit of one of these projects and found that the developers had stripped out all the security checks from the jots. You wanted to elevate yourself to admin? Change it to admin, no problem. These are things that are gonna keep happening. So why do I say this? If we're doing zero trust well, if we're doing it strongly, the attacks are gonna move to session attacks, session hijacking. AppSec's gonna become more important. All right, now all through this, I've been talking about the policy engine, right? We all like that, right? Policy engine, I like one. I don't know about you guys. I've yet to see any successful implementation that had a policy engine. It's usually something more like this. I'm checking at my IDP, I'm checking with my MDM, I'm checking with the EDR, I'm checking with my broker or VPN, I'm checking with the AppSec policy. Now I'm on-prem, so I'm running through uh, my, my NAC and my segmentation. Or no, I'm going to the cloud, awesome, yay cloud. So I got a CASB. Uh, or I got third party, I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff on top of all that. This is something that I'm incredibly, incredibly fascinated by right now. So if anyone has a solution to this, I would love to hear it. Here's some of the things I, I hear when I ask about this. It's fine, we'll integrate at the PowerPoint level. Cool, love that. Or no, it's just defense in depth, they're best of breed. Sure, none of them talk to each other. Sure, if there's any confusion, we know someone's gonna turn one of them off. Sure, if there's troubleshooting or audit, <laughs> we're gonna say, honestly, that's odd. Anyone who's done audit has seen this time and time again with like, we have strong controls. Here it is on PowerPoint. Here it is in our policy. Here's our technology. And then you ask the analyst, like, yeah, it's been off for like three years. But it looks good and audit loves it. So maybe it's best to breed our fence in depth. Maybe, and this is another one I've heard from usually from one of these vendors. Oh, it's simple. What you do is you turn off all the policy and everything else. You just use our policy at the app proxy or, or our policy at the IDP. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> but what about all the toys I bought? And of course, the best way to do this is to chain it so that when I log in or I check my desktop or I flow all the way down to the NAC, that the that policy information is collected all the way and enforced consistently. That's a great way to do it. But today, with zero trust, very few are as that tightly integrated. So this continues to be a, a big problem. So one of the issues is 2028, what happened? Well, we had everything installed and we thought it was turned on and audit said it was great and I passed my, uh, my audit and then we found out it wasn't. One other thing about the end-to-end -end encryption, right? You attack the ends. So I already talked a little bit about this, the excessive, or the OAuth OIDC, um, the importance of AppSec. I wanna talk a little bit about that top one. Another thing I'm very concerned about at the moment is zero trust, least privilege. We hear this all the time, right? Zero trust, least privilege, zero trust, least privilege. Great, love that. Love me some least privilege. Love me some segregation of duties. As an old school IM guy, I can wax poetic about our back. Not even joking. I love it. I don't know why people do PVAC, but it's a whole other thing. But anyways, um, <laughs> the, the thing that I'm concerned about is I'm starting to hear teams go, oh, we don't need to necessarily do good RBAC. We don't necessarily need to do SOD. We don't necessarily have to worry about excessive entitlements and permissions. Why would we do that? We've got uh, zero trust. We already trust you. That's great. Trust you to do what? With what? Right? This is creating a situation where apps have excessive privileges and entitlements that adversaries can and will misuse. All right, next part of this. Let's jump back in time on our time machine for just a little bit. I know I'm taking you back and forward. You guys probably feel like a, some sort of terribly written Doctor Who episode. I apologize. 2010, you guys remember 2010. What were we doing? We were enforcing trust. How were we enforcing trust? Because a user or a resource was going through a policy engine and that policy engine was verifying things. What were our signals of trust? Source and destination, you know, address and ports, 
probably a threat and tell list, something we got off Isaac that we've loaded up to prevent all these countries or all these IP addresses from attacking. And then we got to our resource, and life was good. It's chewy resource. Kindervog said, you know, that's a problem, right? These, these chewy centers are too big. There's a lot of issues there. He brought forward some traditional security ideas, refactoring some new ideas, thus starts zero trust. Back to 2028 for just a minute. I would argue that this story of cybersecurity is the story of chasing Chewy. Every time we're like, we're gonna stop that Chewy center. You better believe that people who put in place firewalls, talk to them sometimes, some of the folks who put in place early firewalls, they would have told you the entire internet was Chewy and we were gonna segment it. We we're gonna build trust, right? This was not like, not thought out. So Chewy just tends to move as we put in place more and more policy sides. Chewy tends to move and morph. And the problem is, when it moves and morphs, it moves and morphs into where we can't see. Why was Chewy a problem with the network in 2010? Because we didn't have visibility past the firewall. Where don't we have visibility today and where's the Chewy today? And this lovely thing? We're running through a policy. We're checking things. Source, port, destination, how the user authenticate, how the device authenticate and then we're gonna allow you in, which effectively moves that Chewy to the resource. On your SaaS applications today, maybe 100, maybe 250, maybe 1,000, how many of them can you get behavior analytics off of? How many can you get intel in terms of data loss? How many do you know when someone has been threatened with a wrench and is doing something inappropriate? Can we see that? No, no, of course we can't. So it creates this very interesting opportunity within Zero Trust and within the SaaS providers. Because if you think about it, some of these ways it's already been solved. Things like DOP, right? Um, if you're running a CASB, if you're running something like you know Umbrella, um, you can call out to DOP if it's exposed over an API like 0365. You can say out of band, hey, what have people been doing with this? You can pull that information back. That's available today. There's also work, shared signals, sharedsignals.guides through all the IDC community, uh, vendor sponsored by many folks, including Cisco, uh, which is saying if these apps notice anything bad, feed that back to the policy engine. I've got UEBA, I've got it on my HR system. Um, the IAM team insists one day soon that HR system is gonna be integrated to the apps and life is gonna be good, but we'll put that aside for a minute. I've got UEBA on my HR system. Suddenly someone comes and starts downloading a whole bunch of stuff. Trips that behavior analytics. What happens? Historically, nothing. Maybe we log them out. In this model, what you could do with shared signals, send a signal back to policy enforcement point and log them out of everything. Prevent them from logging into Dropbox, prevent them from sending email, log them out of everything. Really freaking cool, really freaking cool. A way of thinking about not security protecting the app, but the app providing security protection. That's where we need to be in two in 2028. We won't be there, we're, well, we're on the journey. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good journey. So 2025, where did things go off the tracks? Uh, mismatch between understandings of what the components were doing. Uh, too many different security controls that weren't integrated. Uh, heavily reliance on best of breed and auditors telling us it was all working. Uh, a, a understanding that we put in place a control that worked great, and then the threat landscape changes like it always does, and we're a little bit behind. I think that covers it from that side. There's probably a couple more, probably a couple more. This mismatch between what we think is going on and what is actually going on, I would argue is where hackers both the, the curious, the kind, and the criminal have been living and breathing since day one. And as we put in place controls like zero trust, we'll have better control, better policy enforcement, but again, the Chewy Center remains, again, that mismatch is what allows us to go off the tracks. I'm almost done. At some point in all this, did I miss something? I'm not gonna open up the mic and let you tell me. Just don't raise, everyone's like, yes, Ben. I probably did, right? You're probably like, wait a minute, the way I'm doing Zero Trust is, or wait a minute, my red team once told me, or wait a minute, I read this cool paper, right? I'm sure one of you guys did. You're nodding, you know. 
Write that down. That is why we do pre-mortems. That is the fun part. That's why it's exciting to get folks in the room because together, right, we all have different vantage points. We all have different ideas of what can go wrong and we can create a really good list. And then what we do with that list, workshop it, beat it up, threat model it, give it to the red team, give it to our pen testers, make that part of our vendor assessments, make that part of our proof of concepts, make that part of our annual assessment, make it part of our roadmap. How cool would that be? How cool would that be? And how much data and insight would we get? How much better would we be than waiting to 2028 and waiting for the breaches? Make a game out of it, in other words. Speaking of games and pre-mortems, obviously pre-mortem is a medical term. And it, uh, the, the term came about in 2007. Uh, I always blank on the guy's name, Gary Klein, 2007. Gary, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, introduced the concept in the, into the PMO world. Now, a few decades before that, a few decades before that, 1964, there was a student, a student named John, John Spinello. John was at uh, college. John could have really used a pre-mortem. Much more than me and Monte Carlo Casino, who really needs someone to say, please, Wolf, don't do that. John needed someone. If you ever get a time machine, I would ask you to please go back to 1964 and talk to John. Because John, at that point in time, is in his dorm room. He's got a class project. He's got to come up with a game. And he remembers that these games like, you know, at casino, or not at casinos, I'm sorry, I'm still there, uh, at, uh, at carnivals, right, the, the ring game and everything. So what if I swapped the ring and instead of moving the ring, I made that static and I used some tweezers. Ah, I could, and then I could pull up pieces, right? And he comes out with this idea. He comes out with this idea for his class project. Got an A, that's good. Uh, his father introduces him to a friend and the friend goes, you know what, you should sell this. This is a really clever game. And they introduced them to Marvin Glass. Of course, now we know how that goes to Hasbro and everything else. And John sold Operation. Now, how much did John sell Operation for? While you're thinking about that, I want to say just real quick, those of you of certain vintage who grew up with Operation, I have a, a, a theory that you guys are like the SOC people and the instant response people. I have a theory, and if, if I'm right, tell me, and if I'm wrong, of course, tell me. Uh, but I'd rather be right, so tell me twice if I'm right. Uh, that people who are like, with a steady hand, and with not moving a left or right, I will grab the piece and not set off any alarms. Those are the people I want running my sock. I'm convinced of it. But anyways, so, 1964, John goes to down with Marvin Glass. Marvin Glass buys Operation for him. 500 bucks, 500 bucks for all the intellectual rights. You never really know where things are gonna go. You know? You think he knew that everything would go this way, that it'll be a, a worldwide phenomenon? No. Do you think I know where the security's gonna go by 28? No, right? You never really know. But you can know a few certain facts. People will be people, criminals will be criminals, defenders will be defenders. And you can know that at the end of the day, it's the pieces that define the game. So the pieces that define our security model and the pieces that define our success or failure. One of the trickiest parts about zero trust is those pieces are in everybody else's hands. The networking team, the IT team, the IM team, the help desk, heck, the board if they're asking questions and funding it, the CEO, the CFO, right? Relationships are so incredibly important. Consistency across all those layers is so incredibly important. And as we know, consistency is incredibly hard. So when you're thinking about zero trust, Think through those ways that consistently drops off. Think through ways that we can go astray. Think through ways that pieces aren't aligned. Alignment is really going to drive a lot of that security. But even badly implemented zero trust today will stop a lot of attackers because we're gonna look hard and crunchy and they're gonna go for the chewy. So start there and iterate and get better. Some final thoughts. I like pre-mortems. I hope I've convinced you guys that they're fun too. Do them everywhere, it's a great thing. Uh, specific for zero trust, factor your roadmap to sustain support, interest, and engagement. Be very cautious and aware of that cottage to goblin mode. Be very careful about the phrase, it depends, and be very careful about the phrase, it's a journey. Shore up your uh, areas about a scope. Wherever you're in scope, wherever you're building this, 
is going to be good, is going to be solid, is going to be strong wherever you're out of scope. The endpoints I talked about, insider threat I talked about, AppSec I talked about, shore those areas up because that's where the adversaries are going next. Think about this like compensating controls. We've got strong control in place, we need a compensating control in the other areas. And then as I already mentioned, uh, play with this with your red teams. Give this to your pen testers. Have them beat up on this. You're going to find some really interesting things and be able to challenge some good assumptions. And as you move forward with that and figure out what works and what doesn't, start rationalizing that policy information across your PDPs, your PIPs, your PEPs, so we have been our integration, and please, please push for that integration because that's what's going to make all this maintainable. That is my time, folks. Thank you very much.